All right, let's start with a prayer. And Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to come together and talk about you and learn to love you more deeply. And we understand more truly who you are and who you have called us to be. Make us entirely yours. We entrust this time, this conversation to you, the hands of our mother as we sing. Carry on you, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're coming to a shift now in, in writing and in, and in tone, playing of the scriptures. We cover it real quick. The Torah and the and Judges, and some people will say, you know, the Judges and the Pentateuch are almost one unit. Uh, in certain of the Greek translations, church fathers, if the Judges together with the first one that's called the Hexateuch. And so there is this kind of shift now in tone. And the first shift in tone we get comes to the book of Ruth. Um, and so we go from the judges, which is this very bloody battles, you have you no know, Joshua and the wars, you have Ruth. And Ruth is a very short book, a very simple book. And it is you know, for this day and age, it's, it's very feminine. Um, you have it's so not the first female hero of the Bible. I get, for example, the prophet, the prophet is Deborah. Um, but it's one of the books that was centered around her. Um, Ruth. An interesting book. Um, and I, was, I tried to track down the story and I couldn't. Uh, so I don't remember exactly what the story was about. Um, but the, the story of one famous writer in the 18th, 18th century century. And he and Ruth, his friends, got together. And they would get together and they would read their, their writing. He was a, a still a strong to read today. Um, he pulled out the book of Ruth, and showed it to them, and tell them Mark Strong. And they read it, and this is a sweet story, it's a nice little pastoral story. They didn't know where it was from. They just thought it was this nice, very sweet, bucolic, idyllic scene of this, you know, this marriage, this love story, it's that sweet. Well, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Not more. It is a very sweet story, it is a very lovely story. Um, there was a phrase where it went into kind of, you know, Jesus makes, you all heard it before, that my God should be your God, people should be your people, wherever you go out and fall. But it's not at weddings, but it's said by a woman to her mother in law. So I'm not quite sure why it's done that way, but it is. So let's, let's look at the story of Ruth. Ruth is interesting. Because the, the name is named after a, a, a convert. So it's probably, you have Eric and I'm rich here. A couple of good here. Ruth is originally a Moabite. And the story begins, it's not a very long book, it's a couple of chapters. Um, the story begins where a woman from the tribe of Judah goes and sells in the land of Moab. And her two sons are with her. And they all marry these pagan women. They both marry pagan women. And so it's Ruth, and I forget her, the other, the other um, woman's name. There's two pagan women. So Naomi is the mother. Her two sons marry these pagans. Um, they settle in the land there. And after a time, there is a disease. The two sons die. And so Naomi is going to go back to Israel, go back to my people, go back to my father's house. She's a widow. There's no one to take care of. And Ruth's also with. And Ruth, out of friendship and love for Naomi and for her husband, her husband, it's not mentioned as much in the Bible, um, has become at this point she's, she's she's converted. And she says to Naomi, wherever you go, I'm gonna go with you. And you're gonna be my God. I'm going to stick, I'm not going to go back to my people and worship false gods. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to go follow the true God and I'm going to stay with you and we'll The other daughter-in-law is back home to her people and can see it. 
Yeah. That's not recorded in the same way. Just she takes off his back to her people who have fallen. And then Naomi and Ruth go to one of Judah, and they go to an area uh, where there is a wealthy man named Boaz. Sometimes it's spelled booze. Don't get too excited. <laughs> Boaz is how it's normally pronounced and spelled. And Boaz is about the landowner. In the, the book of Leviticus, there is a law which says when you leave the harvest, the eggs of the field and any second of the wind is left for the poor and for the widows. Um, in other words, don't be as thorough as you could. Don't be overly greedy. And people who are hungry, people who are in your need, especially someone who's elderly or someone who's going to help them out, they have the right to go and gap what's left after the harvest take place. It's a way of giving charity, a way of um, people out. And so Ruth volunteers to go and pick the leanings. Um, we'll see a, a note of this a later. We'll talk about it um, for the end of the class. Um, this, this also comes up, by the way, in the story of the Gospel of Matthew, with the apostle picking the grain in the Sabbath. We know that by the fairies for doing it. But it, it comes from this law, same law. Um, and Ruth goes to goes, do leave for the rest, rest of them. And Boaz sees her, recognizes her both as a poor, as a young woman, uh, taking care of the stuff. He's impressed with us. And so he says to the, his workmen, they even like to walk. Left her to gather up in the likes to, uh, you know, make certain she gets a nice, good share. And he goes and he, she, he does it. She's very grateful to him. They have a conversation. He says, well, basically, I, I talk to him and says, you are a very pious woman who's taking care of her mother-in-law and I'd like to marry her. So they fall in love. They get married. And... Their son is in Jesse. And Naomi takes care of him in her, her old age and raises him, helps raise Jesse. And Jesse, of course, is the father of David. And that's the story. That is the full, complete story of Ruth. It's a very simple story. It's, it's, not, it's, 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 very, it's a big contrast between Buddy Battles and Mount Kevin's kind of simple. Homey sword. What's going on? Where don't like your places go? You're in trouble. I can do that with my coffee. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> go. <laughs> I think he was Obed, and he was the father of Jesse. You're right. <laughs> but it's still... Yes. What happened? So, it mentions Jesse. Sorry. Right at the end. Big child was named Obed. My mind oh, yes. went... Uh, it just has a right. list at the bottom. You, you so, skipped ahead a little bit. Skipped ahead a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're totally right. It's Obed, Jesse, David. So it's a couple of generations back. So it's the great grandmother, not grandmother, excuse me. So the great grandmother. Yes. But you have here the story of preparation from this transition, from this, this trial system where God is king. Now you have, we're going to this history of the kingdom. Right, which is the foundation of break, of course, for Christ to be the king. But his kingship is, is not what people thought. Um, preparation for kingdom, preparation, of course, for church, preparation for um, God to make the world a new way. It's really, again, all this is preparing for the incarnation. And you also have a Gentile being a key part to this preparation. So for the first time we have this introduction outside of the Jewish people. 
where God called the Jewish people, there is people, and from them would come the Messiah, the Galatia. And you have this important figure who becomes part of, of this scene. Part of, part of uh, the coming of the Messiah. And she's originally a pagan. She doesn't end up, she doesn't stay pagan, but she's originally a pagan. And if you go back and look at the Gospel of Matthew, also Matthew, the genealogy, is mentioned by name. You normally, the one, the one, most of the mentions are going, to, are going to be the men, because they're the ones the line passes through. Ruth is mentioned very explicitly. It's an important part of this difference. See, what's being said here is that God's will is to bring all people to salvation. See, it's very easy for us to kind of get stuck in our way and think, well, God only wants this group to be saved. God only wants my group to be saved. Because I'm special. Because I'm not saying something like that. And this is a reminder that of God's will, God's plan, is to save all people. God wants everyone to be called into this kingdom, this church, and this people. He does so specifically by inviting them to be part of the people. Right? So it's not that there's a distinction and she's this outside of forever, and she is this, you know, and there's this separate part. It's not that she starts her own kingdom. It's not, it's not that there is rival kingdom and God has many kingdoms. No, I have my own people who are Moabites, and I have my people who are Israel. It's the form of the one people. And from this grafting off comes the Messiah. You see a second as well in the book of Hebrews, where St. Paul talks about the Gentile people being grafted on Abraham. He says, We were a wild rock, grafted on the vine that's headed by God. As you see here, a couple of important points. There's only one people. There's only one kingdom. There's only one truth. There's only one belonging that forms God. But God does so by calling the other people in He calls them the foreigners. He calls them the Gentiles. He calls them the pagans. He does so making them walk. This then becomes the foundation that are standing that God called the Gentiles too. And the Gospel of Matthew, what's Christ saying to the apostles. Go forth and baptize who? The Jews. Right, that's it, right? No. <laughs> all but people. baptize all nations. The pagans. People who persecute, people who reject you, people who reject God, people who. And this is built upon. You know, this is one of those, those first keys we see there where God goes out and calls on people. Now, Old Testament, New Testament, don't divide them so strong. You have to combine this together with the last book. The book of Judges is all about the bad. Which was what? What was the bad? Eliminate. Eliminate. Right? So we're, we're closing off sin. We can't, we can't heal sin. We can't forgive sin. We can't have sin. All it was limited. And so, so people have, so the pagans who, who have abandoned God, rejected God, are going to be killed. Make room for God's people. They're going to God's room. There's not room for them because they are, have filled up their number of sin. And all, and all they can do without Christ is limit sin. And Christ comes those who are not allowed to respond. This immediately followed by the book of Ruth. And you have then. Pagans join God's people. You can't have both. You can't just isolate them by themselves. Both of these people put together. Why? Well, think about all too often these days, where you have this idea, and unfortunately, you'll see it even among bishops today. You know, people will say, "Well, you know, so and so is a good Jew. God will save." So and so is a good Hindu, God will save. Him. So and so is a good Wiccan, God will save. But atheist, you know, both ideas can be put together. God calls all peoples. God wants everyone to be of sin. 
God wants our words to be redeemed at the same time as they're to be reaped. He said that there needs to be a conversion and a union and a rejection of what's not true. But God's merciful, that's never a jerk. But God is never going to be a liar. God has not found many kingdoms, many peoples, many truths, many religions, many faiths. There's one faith, one religion, one truth in God. Period. And those who only really reject that are going to reject God. Period. But God calls all peoples to himself. God wants all peoples to come to him. God demands what is come to him. So there's still separation. There's still a division. The division is not between from bloodline. It's not from what your ancestors did. It's not from the division of King Gudni. And going back to Genesis, we said right there is that one battle, one war, uh, by God. Uh, the enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will strike the cure, and he will strike the seed. Giving good and evil to God and death is always going to be a battle, always going to be a war, always going to be a division. And this, of course, is repeated by Christ in Matthew chapter 25. This is the story of the sheep and goats, right? where, where Christ says, I will separate the sheep and the goats. The division. But what the, what was the cause of that division? Sin. sin. Those who follow the path of sin are not going to be saved. They're going to join the devil and the angels who rebel against God. And so the division is not between it's not something that God the source of the vision is not from it. It's from a rebellion in his heart. Sin, sin. But God is not going to pretend there's no vision. And so there's this very stark truth that right at the same time, everyone is going to be saved. And those who claim they will be saved are not reading the scriptures, not reading the faith, but a lot of people. But at the same time, yes, yeah, so we have to have both held. Everyone is offered something. God never looks at someone and says, oh, you're not pretty enough, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you belong to the wrong people. Nor does he even say you're a sinner. Right? Ruth began as a pig. Ruth worshipped false gods. Ruth didn't begin life as this, as this pious little girl. She began life as a pig. And she probably did participate in human sacrifice. She probably did participate in some horrendous things. She's a young one. You change this. And our blessed sir says, From me will come the Messiah. Right? Something that um, was the dream, honestly, of, of the pious Jewish woman. They would dream that they would be granted the, the grace of, of being the mother of the Messiah. Uh, it's something that Ruth gets granted as a pay. So there's a beautiful contrast, this beautiful. You know, um, union between these two ideas and keep them together. Because you only get stuck with one, and you're going to be busy to say. Only stuck with one part, you're going to be understand. And so we had the story. The point is where God is preparing the way for the kingdom. He's beginning just to show that what Messiah is going to come, how it's going to come, what's going to happen. It happens to human love, to human devotion, to human charity, to human virtue. And of course, and Boaz, of course, is worked, also worked with us. Being generous, being kind to the poor, being loving, taking the pain in. And from their love, God makes something wonderful. And that's the other part of the story. Let me, let, me stop, let me stop there. There are a bunch of ideas here. Questions on this? There's a lot in here, right? Questions on this? Okay. Other part of the story. Is God has found those stories. Right? The Bible is not so. And so it's yes, this is a, it's a very simple story. It's a, it's a very sweet little story. It's a very short book. But it's scripture. Where God comes to teach us who he is, to show us his fall, to bring us to himself. 
God is found in these simple, ordinary things. God reveals himself in these simple, ordinary things. God calls us to himself in these simple, ordinary things. God is found in these other But it's not that it's not a pastoral story. It's not this simple love story. It is. But it's a fact. And yet, yeah, you have this, this is the path that God takes to come to his people. God uses Ruth and Boaz and their love for each other and their kindness to each other and kindness to other people. Come at But this is this is one of the, this this is God's beginning, his journey to say, I'm going to come as king. I'm going to come as all people, I'm going to come to be my church. And he uses the simple love between these two people. See, sometimes we try to keep God out of the ordinary life. We imagine that God is only found in the extraordinary. We think, well, well, you like the science. We wait to hear miracle stories, the, the big preachers, the one of the people who convert 3,000 a day. And that's, that's true, he's there, obviously. Who's the greatest of all sex? Does she work miracles? Do you report it? No. Did she preach? No. Did she write any books? No. She was a wife and a mother. She was a household. They all up. Ordinary, simple. The greatest of all sex. Most of Christ's life, what was it? Carpenter. He wasn't preaching, he was working miracles, he wasn't noticed. You know, so that another good preach, they say, well, wait, where did you get this one? <laughs> Who is he? What, what's he doing? Putting on air, saying things, he did this stuff. It was fun. Later, later on, they just preached, yeah, they, they were shocked. But they don't remember. And so the thing is, you have to remember to look for God, to serve God, and love God in the ordinary way. See, God doesn't simply want to be found on Sundays, but of course, must be there too. Or only on the big exciting events in our life. Birthdays, marriages, death. Of course, he wants to be there too. But God wants to live with us. God becomes man to live with us. God wants to be a member of your house, a member of your family. To walk with you, to sit with you, to be at table with you. To go watch movies with you, to go at the park with you, to go hiking with you. It sounds like funny. He wants to be part of your, your real life. Not just to go out of your real life and find God. And also, all too often, we make a vision about this thing where we leave our real life and go find God. And it's true, God is above, God is beyond, God is greater than we are. But God has that to come in. He does so that our real life can be transformed by Him. So everything we do in the ordinary can be transformed. Now we have to have these protection points because our goal is here, our goal is heaven. It is above us and beyond the grave of us. But the purpose is to live these ordinary things and these common things and these simple things with our God. God wants to live with you. God wants to be with you. God wants to spend time with you. So we have this simple love story showing us that. There's also then becomes a reflection, an image then, of Christ's, God's love for his church. Where God takes the church as a whole, is, is perfect with the Bible sinful. Right? It's sinful because we're sinners. It's sinful because we're weak. It's perfect because we're given grace and holiness and the sacraments of Christ himself. And so we're, we, are, we are these pagans. Who have done these horrible things, worshiping false gods, called Christ, called to God, called to heaven, called to eternity, called to this marriage between the Lamb and those who are sacred, this union between God and man. And so this becomes a symbol then, the preparation for this this image, this snapshot of the church. So that later on, when the apostles begin preaching to the pagan nation. They already have an image. What happened? What's it going to look like? So that the church becomes then 
this in the symbol of we have these pagans, we're all. Who God wants to grab to himself, bring to himself, and call to himself. And notice the pagans are a new church, new people. They're grafted on too. Why? Because the people was founded by God, and made by God, formed by God, and sharing God's own life. And so we pagans, and one of us here can qualify for that if you're born Catholic. We pagans can wrap it off the life of God. We help us to live with God, walk with God, live with God, and therefore it's here on earth, then the eternity, eternal life. That's the book of um, So it's a beautiful story. Lots in there, but I'll talk about that alone. Questions? Okay. Let's go on then to Samuel. Samuel's interesting figure because Samuel is the last of the judges. And the first of the prophets. Now he's not the first prophet to appear in Scripture. I said you know, there are other examples of people who prophesied spoke for God. But the man called the prophets, he's kind of seen as the first one, even though there were others spoke before. You just see Samuel kind of cuss, but in this sense, this new transition, that this new way God works was people. And so even though there are other prophets, Moses, for example, Deborah and Aaron. Abraham, another prophet, of course, but, but he is one of these, the first the prophet. He also is a priest. He's the high priest. You notice here then he himself rolls into himself three offices. The judges were their kings, right? Prophet, those who are anointed by God who speak for God, and priest, who's a figure of Messiah, this triple anointed one, priest, prophet, king. Like many of these figures, not perfect, but he is a saint. Um, The story of Samuel begins actually with his mother. Samuel's mother is a woman named Anna. Sometimes, it's spe sometimes you'll see it spelled Hannah. version of the scripture <coughs> is one of two wives of a Jewish man when he had this whole little numerous thing in the face. But Anna is barren. He has no children. And because of that, she's mocked by her right. Because being barren was a curse. Um, so again, now the same thing is twist around with the barren kind of plus. It's still not a curse for now, aren't they? Age. Um, by discussion. <laughs> um, and part of that is because there was this recognition that, that woman had had that this role that the man could fulfill, right? that they would give birth to the Messiah, they would give birth to the Savior of the world. And so there was this blessing associated with, with having children, bearing children, the life. Anna has no children, she's barren. And her husband loves her and he's good to her. But she feels the shame of it, she feels the uh, approach of it, she's mocked for it. And she was a very sad life. And so Anna goes out to the temple 
And the high priest at the time was a priest by the name of Eli. Sometimes you'll see it spelled Heli. What's with the uh, aggressive de-aging of all these names? <laughs> it's simply a question of how it transposed from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to English. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, why is Yeshua both Joshua and Jesus? <laughs> and Jesus. <laughs> I was just curious because it seems like they just only went after the ages. Because there's some, some kind of symbolism to that. <laughs> it's like a herb. It's a silent H. <laughs> only here in America. For England, they charge the H. <laughs> right. I always said it. Because you, you, you break it and you apply it. That is the worst insult anyone has ever given me. <laughs> Stick around, partner. <laughs> so the Eli, the high priest of the time, he sees her. Prayer at that time, we'll see it a couple of places too. It's interesting. Most people, when they prayed, would, would, would be reciting psalms, would be reciting um, scripture. And so he spoke in a lot. Um, it was unusual for people to read out. That it wasn't done. Uh, there's a story of, I think it's St. Ambrose, um, where. St. Ambrose or Dust? One of the other two. Where someone comes to the room and sees people silent and kind of wonders what's he doing. Because everyone always wrote. Because mm -hmm. religion was so much, such a rare thing back then, to be literate, that no one was silent. So when you pray, it was done a lot. It was done a It was done. But Anna prays not. When she's not on the words, when she's crying on the words, when she feels like everything is wrong. She says, oh, can I deal with this drunk woman in front of the temple steps? What am I doing here? She says, woman, it's three in the morning. Go home and sleep on your drunkenness. <laughs> she says, my Lord, I'm not drunk and this sad. Pray for me that I may have a son. The Lord bless the son. If the lesson of the Son, I will consecrate him to God and give him to, give him to God from his youth. So the response of Anna, why don't you not get mad and insult her? I've been insulted, but I was upset because he, hey, you drunken idiot, and goes, go away. You're an embarrassment. Anna's a lot more respectful than the high priest. <laughs> but she wants a child. And is willing to give her desire and her greatest desire to God. How often is our impulse to say, I want this great desire for myself. I want this so I keep. I want this so I want to. And I want this so I can give it. So I can please God and pray so. And you said, okay, I'll say a prayer for you. You know, sure. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go away. This kind of indication to read the Greek scriptures. And go, yes, yes, my child. If you do bless him, um, go home and be at peace. <laughs> uh, and lo and behold, she conceives. So after a while, here's her prayer. She has a son. And when he is weak, when he's, he's still a small, uh, he's taken to the temple. By Anna, he says, I am going to pray, and God has my prayer, and here is my son. And so he goes, he, and from a young age, Samuel lived in the temple, and serves the temple, and serves Elon. Twelve years of age, let me back, thirteen years of age, Jewish law, for a man, is very important. For a woman, it was when there was the physical changes of that trigger. Uh, but for a man, 30 years of age was the moment you became a man. Um, and the, before this time, you were considered a child. You're considered um, not responsible for yourself. Once you turn 13, you're responsible for yourself. You're expected to fill the Jewish command, you're expected to fill the, 
the Jewish commands of paying temple tax, of going to the temple three times a year. When you're 12, when you're a child, you don't have to. Or nothing to do with the authority of your parents. In a certain way, you're saved long from your parents because you're a point of order, point of culture. Yeah. Uh, how do they count birthdays? Is it the day you're born? How old are you when you're born? So it's your, I think they didn't say when you people. Okay. So the, the, the 13th, uh, so completes on your 12th year, maybe the 13th. Okay. Um, Samuel, at 12 years old, is called by God. So he's given to God before he's conceived. He's called by God before he's born. At 12 years old, he is sleeping um, close by in the adults in our room. It's close by the priest, Eli, the priest calls him. Um, let me back up. We'll get to that story. Eli has two sons. And Eli's two sons are jerks. They are priests, but they're in it for the, for the fame of fortune, basically. Um, and they will go to the sacrifice and they'll take the best. It's the part of the people who give to God that they take themselves. The God is this. This is ours. And they would go and they would, when, when the stuff was being on the altar, they would sort out the best for themselves and the rest of them. The people wouldn't want to sacrifice because basically it was a their sacrifice were not completed. Were we given to God? They were taken by Eli's sons. And Eli um, was a He was sad about it. This is a shame. He was a, he was he was afraid to do it. And so God intervenes. God steps up. God corrects it. I the call of Samuel as the as the prophet and as the judge to correct and reform and heal people. Remember, the judges were going to heal, go back to the law, get rid, rid of the stuff. This time, the rock is up from the outside. The rock's hole. The book of Judges are always good on the outside, and it ends up being a pagan nation that conquers them. This time, the rock is the priest. The rock is those who look at the temple who aren't doing their job. And so, God comes to reform this, to heal this, and to prepare the way for his information. So, Samuel, 12 years old, is sleeping. And here's a voice that says, call his name, Samuel said. Samuel says, go to Eli. He gets up, runs to Eli, and says, here I am, go. He goes, no, I did that. Go back to bed. <laughs> he says, okay, go back to bed. The voice says, Samuel said, it's up. Here I am, go. And Samuel says, no, let me call him. Go back to bed. We realize this, this is now God calling. See, this happens again. Simply say, Here I am, Lord, speak, your servant listen. So Samuel sleeps again here a third time. And number three. Yeah. Samuel, Samuel, here I am, Lord, your speak, your servant listen. And Samuel, God points Samuel, prophet, day to 12. He says to Samuel, Because of what Eli is doing, the line's going to be cut off. That is, he's not correcting his sons. His sons are going to be destroyed and killed. And Samuel's, and Eli's going to be cut off. I wanted you to, to be the new judge and, and the new healer of Israel. What does it sound like? What's that? It's the <laughs> David and his sons, yep. How about that story? How about Jesus the temple? At 12 years old. Oh yeah. And so, interesting contrast. And in fact, to go to the book of let's go let's let's read that. Let's go to First Samuel chapter two.
And of course, it's one of those things where you know, like some of the names for it. So hopefully you can all follow the right that's a, that's a two symbols. One second to find. I thought it was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, first Samuel 2, verse 26. At least according to this one. Uh, so, it's after the Lord warning Hannah, giving her more children, Eli's to try the rebuke of the sons. Um, it, it's before the call of Samuel. Be healed. 
to be the one who's going to restore the priesthood, the one who's going to build the temple. But he does so in a different way of saying this. He isn't called from somewhere else. He is the culture. He is the voice. He is the one. And he does so beginning by putting this in the heart of the home. He does so, and here is where he reforms the priesthood. Here is where he under Mary. That's where he reforms the temple. That's where he heals the priesthood. That's where he reforms the worship of the page of God. Samuel, at the age of 12, is called by God and has to leave behind his family. Leave behind everything else. He has to step away from the ordinary life and into something sacred. Christ is bringing the sacred to us. Christ is the sacred. Christ is God himself. He doesn't have to step away from the world. He's coming to heal the world, transform the world, to redeem the world. And so we see here the holiness of merit. We see who Christ is. We see how Christ comes to save. And we also see here the, the, in the place of Mary, it's Mary who was given this option. Basically, Christ says to her, you can choose. You can decide while I'm going to work on the Mary could have said, okay, you're five years old, you're found the temple, you know, the high priest fall. And I'm going to get the sword. And then Christ stood up. Christ certainly could have taught and preached been a rabbi and that would have been in the mold of, of Samuel and the other high and the other prophets and priests. But Mary says, no, you're coming home. <laughs> but she's given this choice where God lets us have a say in his plan. Let's us choose what will happen. Let's us work with him, let's be involved with him, let's us have a real place in who and he is subject to it. And, and for another 18 years, there's silence. So, I mean, we can go out more into that, we'll leave it there for right now, but just think about it, attend to it, pray about it. it it's beautiful. It's lots of it. Time goes on. Um, Eli's not, tries to practice sons, but half heartedly. And then the Philistines come and start invading the land. Right? And it's the same story. Right? Once the, um, the people fall away from Christ, fall away from God, um, the pagans take over. They start following false gods, the, everyone becomes pagan. Same old too. You know, it's. In our day and age, you start leaving God behind and lo and behold, that people stop going to church. You always start throwing in the face. If you're not faithful enough, faithful something else. Um, the son of Eli say, Don't worry about me, no one had to deal with this, no one had to fix this. God is here, the Dark Covenant. And we're going to take the Dark Covenant out, we're going to go destroy the Philistine because it does us the past. We haven't gone to battle in the past or the covenant. God's come and conquer. God's defeated. God's healed it. Let's do that. And so they go to the covenant, confident in, in God and care of everything. And the Philistines destroy them. And the sons of Eli are killed. And when Eli hears about this defeat, the capture of the covenant, he, he's so upset he has to have a part of it, basically. Also back in the house. And Sam must take over. But the Ark of the Covenant is now in the hands of the pagans. Why is this a big deal? What's the Ark of the Covenant? It's God's power to them. It's God's power. It's God to them. It's not God to them directly, but it's God's. So he dwells, yes, so God's presence. So, so, it's, it's not that they don't really think that the, the ark was God, but it was God's point of contact. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, so if, if the ark comes on, 
In the Ark of the Covenant of the Ten Commandments was the staff of Aaron, the priesthood, was the man, God taking care of it, was, you know, everything was there. And God would appear in fire, or light, and cloud over the Ark of the Covenant, saying, I'm with you. Now the pagans have. And the Philistines, you know, they recognize there's something special about this. Um, even though the pagans, you know, they have to say, this is just some superstition. They say, you know, they were terrified, and that's when they were going to be killed and rally, and they conquer Israel. Like, cool. Look, this is a God. But our God, Dagon, is more powerful, so we'll put the temple of Dagon, and we will um, celebrate. And God steps up. <laughs> and there's a place of ice, and there is a rash of boils on the Philistines. Nothing dead. But super annoying, very painful, and very obvious where it comes from. What was the rash? A uh, boils. Boils. Uh, Rats and rash. Yeah. Not <laughs> large. Not in combination. <laughs> but it means the food's being spoiled, and if the food's being fouled, it means that they have these painful sores over their bodies. And they're like, okay, when this all started happening, all of a sudden we brought. No, all oh, that happens is that all of the idols start falling on the faces. So the, the idols will stay up. Pretty much, they keep falling down. You know? <laughs> I say, okay, okay, there's something happening. This isn't good. And they try to move around. Every time they move, something happens. Mice, boils, and the idols fall out. <laughs> and so they run to Israel and say, to me, to Israel, they please take this ark back. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Take it back, you win. Isn't that a bit of a reflection of the end of uh, Exodus? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Pray for me, go! <laughs> so the Philistines learning faster than the Pharaoh. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. There's only two small plagues. No one dies, no one, uh, but they, but they, we can't handle them. Right? Because there's no covenant, there's no union with them. Uh, and so they give the ark back. This happens a lot, right? Every other time you look at the judges, it's all, I mean, yes, it's the story of Gideon, where, where God entered the battle. This is the first time where, where Israel is doing nothing. And Israel can't, is, is, is utterly abject. Israel is totally failed. And all of a sudden, God's still the judge. God's still fighting back. So Samuel takes over, Samuel begins to reform, and Samuel begins to kill the people. Um, and the Philistines during the time of Samuel are never a threat again. So they won the great victory and never a threat ever again. So before we come to the thing, we'll stop there. Comments or questions on any of this stuff so far? What's the most important thing in the ark? Ten maps. Well, well, the most important thing in the ark is actually in the ark. It's, not it's just going to be the fact that between the ark, um, so the ark is made of two sections. You have the box, which contains the signs of the covenant, um, which is carried around the court. And so the actual ark itself, in some ways, the, the, the least important part. You have here uh, the manna, so God feeding his people, the staff of Aaron, and the Ten Commandments, the, the tablets. This is probably the most important part because it's written by God's hand. But more importantly even than that is the propitiatory, the mercy seat, which is the lid. So the lid is sacred more because it has the uh, adoring cherubs. <laughs> this is going to get interesting. <laughs> I'm impressed with this article. <laughs> the adoring cherubs. So it's too, so, it's simply you know, not exactly different interpretation. You know exactly what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> we have this is the mercy seat because this is where 
God would appear. So God would appear as a shining light or as a cloud on this mercy. This was, this was a, a earthly symbol, symbol of God's throne, to which God would appear and speak to his people and show his presence. And so this part is called the mercy seat. This is God's throne. The fancy name is the propitiatory, which means mercy seat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Christ, by the way, is called the Hebrews repitiatory of, of God. Um, he is the place where God dwells, where God speaks to his people, where God reveals his will to and then guides his people. But this is this this is this, this is the most important part. This is where God appears. Um, and so yeah, basically, you know, as Tara said, when the Philistines have the ark, they have God's presence. The people are cut off from God. They have all this stuff. Covenant. So this, this is covenant. This is God's presence. They like went in the back and dialed him up. <laughs> well, and on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, when you had the, the Day of Atonement, they would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. Um, after the temple, after the ark is lost, it goes to the altar in the back there. This was in its own special room, the Holy of Holies. And the Day of Atonement, the blood for the forgiven people was sprinkled on the seat of mercy. So it, exactly, you're, you're right. I mean, they're, they're laughing, but, but that's exactly what would happen. This is, this is where Joshua and Moses would speak to God. This is where they would see God. This is where Joshua would remain in prayer and adoration of God. And this is where. Um, and you know, once a year, I could enter and speak God's name only once a year, and would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice here. So yes, this is this is exactly you know, whatever image you want to use. So this is a, a wormhole to heaven. This is this is <laughs> an anchor point, you know, where they they have a call to God's castle. But it's exactly what's happening here. This 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 is a big deal. Yeah. Or was it? Where is it? It was hidden, but did it get taken up to hell, or is it still hidden? There's a couple theories. <laughs> so, um, can I go out on the limb and say one of them is that Jesus completely replaced it? That's not a theory. That's the truth. <laughs> um, so, the, I mean, obviously, so as great as this says, we have the great. Um, I meant fun. I just meant function. I didn't yeah. mean, like actually physically like. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so absolutely, as great as this says. That's great. That's far right. This, this is a symbol, an image uh, where God could choose to come and not choose to come. That's really God, literally. That's far right. Uh, and we all have entered into his presence and be before him, not just one man. Everyone of us. People have still been looking for it for centuries, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, one theory is to take him to heaven, to stand into heaven, but he had the chair of them. One theory is he's lost somewhere, and one the, the Ethiopians claim to have. There is a monastery in Ethiopia that they claim to have it, uh, but they only, they only one monk's allowed in there, and he's, he's, he's and, and only one sees it. Is he a leader? He's not a leader. But no, but he's a, he's a priest appointed by this monastery. Um, this is Kaveh Monastery in Ethiopia, and he lived there his entire life. He's a hermit, and when he, when he dies, he's replaced by another member of the monastery, um, and no one else is allowed to see it. So who knows what's in there? Who knows if it's true or not? But that is the claim there that no one else, that no one's allowed to see it, check, and check, see it's true. But wasn't that kind of how it was when they had the tents and everything? Only the high yeah, priest right. could go once, one day a year right. or something? The difference is this monk in Ethiopia, if it's true, is that it's 24 7. He's a hermit, okay. spending time in that racial God. Uh, if, if, if it's true. Uh, and it could be. Uh, but it could be something else, too. It, it's one of those things where it's. it's Fascinating, but again, we have the real thing. So it's interesting, but. There's a term that I heard, it's called Shekinah glory or something. Is that the Shekinah, yeah. light of God? Or... Let me actually erase some of this board. <laughs> board. Wait. I forget. I forget. So the Shekinah 
is the sign of God's glory. That's this. And so it had something to do with the Shekinah is a glowing cloud. So a cloud of light that was traditionally believed to be in the form of a dove. I'm just waiting. When he says you're going to come here, you're going to have one of those old uh, slide projectors. <laughs> <laughs> now, why do you think this matters? Holy Spirit form a dove. So the mercy seat is Christ. The Holy Spirit hovers over the mercy seat. When, when the dove comes over Christ, the, the Holy Spirit comes over, the, he's hovering over the mercy seat, showing God's presence, showing God's there, while the Father speaks. So this is this not a literary idea of the dove? It was actually something to do. It was something that connected, connected back to the seat of glory. Yeah. But the, part, the covenant, the center of the worship of God in God's presence. Um, so you'll, you'll see trace of this, for example, in Psalm, it's Psalm 93, uh, where uh, keep out of the shadow of your wings. It's not, it's not just a literary poetry advice, referring back to this kind of glory. Um, where the, the shadow of your wings was this cloud, this glowing cloud. So again, what when transfiguration, what appears, a cloud. That covers the the the, 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 the Mount Tabor. But Elisha is fleeing. What does he see? He's a cloud. And yeah. how is it pronounced again? It's because I always heard of Shekinah, but you said it differently. Shekinah, yeah, that's fine. Um, no, but, but you said Shekinah. Shekinah. I, I said Shekinah, but I've heard it other ways too, and so I'm not gonna. I, I haven't looked at, at the actual Hebrew. It's my problem, and so. When I see it translated into English, um, it, it, didn't check, it didn't check the, it didn't check the Hebrew. When I see it in English, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how the Hebrew is pronounced. Um, because English, like Yeshua or Joshua or Jesus, mm -hmm. doesn't always match up with the Hebrew. So gotcha. for now, just let's say, if you heard of Shekinah, stick with Shekinah. Um, well, I can't tell you where I heard it. <laughs> it wasn't at the Catholic Church. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit, sign of God's presence. Um, and yeah, Christians in the form of God. Okay. But no. yeah. How long did the Philistines have the um, Not very long. About a little bit than that. Um, they dealt with the boils for that long? Well, they moved it around other places on the temple. They moved it around the temple, then they moved to another temple, then they said, you know what, this is not worth it. They moved around for a little bit, and they said, let's do that. Um, so they didn't have like a bunch of feasts or anything that no. they had did not have that. Well, oh, you mean in terms of, well, I mean, it, it was enough of a big deal where, there, yeah, there would have been certain things that could have done. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, okay. but the fact that they just had it all. Because this again was, was God's protection, God's presence uh, with them. What's the said is by their sin, they lost God. Right? By their sin, God let them be defeated. But was there a conflict that the ark was unclean? No. Because it's God's presence. Um, so the, the thing that would have been is that there's no discussion or concern of that. Temple, yes, but it's, it's longer. But not the, the ark was never set up. And the Philistines were smart enough not to touch it, I guess. I thought you just well, fell over dead. Yeah. It depended. <laughs> <laughs> they got the attack the somehow. Uh, it's but, one of those things I yeah. think where God probably uh, changes the rules based on what lesson he wants to teach us <laughs> people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the other Philistines, too. I mean, you know, again, God's goal is to destroy them. God's goal is to convert them. And so they left the take of the temple, and there they see their God fall on his face and adore, you know, the, the ark. So their chief God falls down and worships the ark. And then they get these little annoyances. <laughs> that's why they figure out, you know what, this, there's something very great that we can handle. And has to, yeah, he has to go back to, to where it belongs. And this is long lust. And, and, and so they're being purified and cleansed and called to repent as well. <laughs> so when the 
Solomon builds the temple and brings the ark in. In a couple of passages, it says that the ark only contains the tablets. What happened to the staff and the manna? Um, it doesn't say only, but it mentions, again, that's, that's the most important part. And, and so emphasizes that. Um, they're all kept together. Um, if you look at other places, it, it's made it clear that they're there as well. Uh, but there are times where emphasize the Ten Commandments simply because these are human objects that relate to covet. This God actually made himself. Um, so, so they're emphasized commandments. And again, this is also as well as the seat of the law. Right? And, and the law, the Jewish people, the law was made, made them Jews. Right? And so this is so you have here God's presence, God's commands, God's word. The law was just the commandments. I mean, you think the commandments. The, the law was better than the commandments should be the law. Really. It's more than the commandments. But the law was the center and the heart of their relationship with God. Um, and it is the image of the eternal word that they make us black. Um, so it's emphasized. It's the God's apparentness to the incarnation. Uh, or again, every one of us. Um, so, for example, the uh, <laughs> in the temple, <laughs> we had a couple different courts. So you had the the three main courts. Um, so you had three gates. Look at this church. We had one, two, three. Um, and the, the one of them was you had little walls and doors. You also had had uh, just a curtain and a, basically an altar rail. Um, but the court of the priests, only the priests would go into. The people sat outside. Holy of holies, only the one priest would go into. Only once a year for the great sacrifice. Where did the people sit in church? In the court of the priests. Right? You're all taking part in the sacrifice. You're all sharing, sharing the divine sacrifice. Right? You all have, have a, as a baptized member of the physical body, you receive the shared communion with God. But that's sacred. Right? The reason, church is designed like this for a reason, where it's kind of take you back to the sacrifice in the temple and say, God's given you a tremendous, incredible gift. This, this is a big dog deal. That's a, that's a technical term. It's easy for me. <laughs> um, but the question on this. Just a quick one. With the staff of Aaron, um, yeah. when, we, when you mentioned it a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, yeah. um, you made reference to St. Joseph and the lilies. Is mm -hmm. it lilies that, that flowered too? It, it, it doesn't say, it just says they flowered. Um, I, I think there's all the connection, art's connected, it's often shown that way mm -hmm. because of that connection of the, the high priest attending Fudu to God and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's more of an artistic depiction as opposed to a middle depiction. But who knows? I mean, God is cool that way. <laughs> um, but I don't think it mentions the flowers. I think it says blossoms. Um, and so the impression I got is, is, is it's probably not, not flowers, it's probably more like the blossom of a tree. Um, it was where this dead tree, this dead branch comes to life and grows branches, um, as opposed to flowering, which don't really grow on frogs. Uh, but if I, if I find I'm wrong about that, you know, I'm not going to be upset. <laughs> Other question? Okay. There's a couple of things you can look at, though, in the story. And the first is simply that God is faithful. God is faithful when we're not. God keeps his promises and keeps who he is even when you don't. God says that people walk with people and work with people. And even when we fall away and fail and do the wrong thing and are idiots, God doesn't get confounded or confused or fall away. And even as Eli has fallen away, God's preparing Santa. 
God's preparing for the new phase of his people's history. Anna and Samuel are type that the virgin birth. You see here of God works beyond nature, outside of nature, where this woman could conceive by herself. That would happen in a natural way. Samuel conceived in normal way to another wife. But it's this, this image where, where it's just like in Abraham and Sarah, just like the people in the Testament. You have through this image where God steps in. When nature cannot. He's not preparing the way for his mother. Uh, when you have this, this image, the symbol where God steps in and begins the new and holy. Right? It's the symbol of holiness because God has stepped in to take care of his people and to heal his people. <clears throat> we don't have to cover you have this important point here, but this was seen as, the, as a symbol of holy communion, right? Literally, it's communion with God. And this more than becomes you know, what happens when we receive being unworthy. You have to prepare while you have to live in grace. You don't need grace of repentance. Eli's sons, who are named in the Bible, uh, Eli's sons, uh, Hophni and uh, but both, both of them just presume upon their position, upon the foundation of God, and there's our repentance. They just say, God will do this. We have control of God. You know, we have God in the box. Literally. Right? We bring them out and they come across. There's our repentance and the desire to change, or the desire to reform. And so, because of this, they are struck dead. Because of this, the are lost. See, when we receive Holy Communion, we try to put God in the box. When we say, God must do what I say, do it according to my rules, according to my whims, according to what I want, we end up cutting ourselves off from God. And so there is warning here between, there's only going to be grace if there is a desire for, it for the union with God. Because grace is not simply God obeying us. Grace is when God and I live together. Grace is a friendship and a love between me and the eternal. And so if I try to have grace and with God according to my rules, according to my whims, according to what I want, it's not going to work. It's not going to I am going to end up killing myself. That was involved from God. Sorry, I'm concurring here because sorry, it's out of the teeth. I want to get through Saul. <laughs> And you also have here that Samuel is a reform from the heart. So Samuel, as a response in contrast to this, Samuel loves God, desires God, and gives God his heart. So there is a reform and a healing in Israel. The pagans don't, don't ever, never threaten um, as long as Samuel's alive. Um, Phil is not going to threaten them. Because the reform begins in the heart. Not with a battle, not with a war, not with this great victory. But with the pagans being humbled by God and by mice. <laughs> and mice is lowly. God, God doesn't come with fire and brimstone, he comes with mice. You know, because what he's saying is, I, I don't have to show my power. I don't have to show this great thing. I have to show this tremendous act. Mice are this. There's also a theory that, again, just like, like, like the Egyptians, mice are one of the gods they worship. Again, so you have, you have this. Condemnation, this mockery of, of the false gods. Um, but healing comes from the heart, from grace, from turning away from sin. Depends on that. In this seventh of King, do we want to try to get through Saul real quick? Or do you want to wait until it? I'll do the other Later. Try to, what is it? Later. 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 Okay. Alright, so let's close with prayer then and we'll kind of deal with the Saul and David. Um, I'll always make a new sheet because, because I, I know I should, I should, and start David. I'll always just make, make, make a new sheet. Um, so, we yeah, never know. <laughs> we'll save our own hands just in case. Yeah. Any other questions on this thing before we end? Um, just going back to Ruth real fast. Yeah. Uh, are Ruth and Boaz considered saints or any kind yes. of? Yes. Okay, they are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, basically, 
most of the phases of the Old Testament, unless they're very clearly sinners, are considered saints. Uh, because the, the, they're heroes and following God, um, part of the covenant, part of walking with God, we are seen and recognized as saints. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. Let's close the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, help us to recognize your presence, the presence of your Son. Help us to recognize what you made us for. Help us to remain faithful to you in word and action. Put our hearts with your love and to be into your truth. We all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Mighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father.